guys, Probable 1701 here today, and today we're going to dive into the wilderness years era of Doctor Who and the third Doctor, and we're going to talk about one of the two audio Doctor Who stories that came out back in the 90s, and we're going to start with the first one, The Paradise of Death, which of course starred John Pertwee as the third Doctor, Sarah Jane Smith as Elizabeth, or Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane Smith, and Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier, and I noticed, I recognize the voice, we have Peter Miles in this as well. And you guys know I love when Peter Miles shows up in Doctor Who. I love his performance in Invasion of the Dinosaurs, in the Silurians, and in Genesis of the Daleks. I'm just a huge fan of when he shows up in Doctor Who. And so learning that he is in this story really got me excited. He just has this really cool voice. He makes a really good villain. <laughs> I've always been really impressed with his performance as Niter. It's very easy to get exactly who the Khalids are kind of supposed to be representing, and part of that is Peter's performance as Niter is just so good in that role. Um, now, I've never listened to any of the, either of these stories before. Uh, I'm going to do all five parts in this video, but I'm going to review them separately as I watch them, and then I'll edit them all together. So first, I'm going to talk about part one. Uh, it took me a minute to really get engaged. I was a little confused. Sometimes that happens in audios with me where I feel just disoriented. I can't quite get what's going on. I get kind of lost before things start kind of fitting together. Uh, and kind of some of the stuff happening at the beginning, like it kept cutting back and forth between a couple people talking, kids talking, kids getting eaten or something. And it was very disorienting. Well, it finally started clicking fairly early on. Uh, I love hearing John Pertwee, Elizabeth Sladen, and Nicholas Courtney together in their roles. Uh, and basically getting a new adventure with them is so amazing. That's the problem with like newer Big Finish stories with the third Doctor is, of course with all of these actors gone and uh, with someone else having to voice them, with someone else having to voice the third Doctor. It, it's not the same. So actually getting another third Doctor era story, basically, with the original actors, with John Pertwee back, is wonderful. I, I, I am liking that. John does sound noticeably older. I mean, it's, it's very obvious to me that he is considerably older. That kind of thing doesn't really bother me. It's something my mind makes note of, but it doesn't bother me. Willing suspension of disbelief kicks in. I'm fine. But he still delivers his lines so well. I love... Obviously, this takes place during Season 11. Looks like maybe right after Invasion of the Dinosaurs, perhaps. Because he's back on Earth, and he references the Time Warrior with Iron Guard. So I'm guessing maybe right after Invasion of the Dinosaurs, because... Sarah, I love how well Sarah's been written so far in part one. She feels like that season 11 Sarah, that very indivi strong individuality streak, very much no nonsense, do her own thing, doesn't need the doctor to take care of her. Uh, and she's a journalist. And remember, she's a journalist. And she's tr that's what she's doing in this story. She is trying to be a journalist. And she's basically interviewing the doctor. And the doctor realizes he's being interviewed. And he's like, wait, what? Interview? <laughs> the way John Pertwee does that line, I love it. And before he can really say anything, that's when the Brigadier shows up. Great to have Nicholas back. And explains, hey, a body's been found. I need you to come here. And it causes the doctor to mess up his experiment. So, of course, even though he messes up, he blames it on everyone else. Now, look what you made me do. Confound it. <laughs> I love the way he's... I forget exactly what he says there, but just his... <clears throat> I love his reaction to that, what he says there. This contraption with this connivance. And I, I forget what he says, but it's hilarious. I love it. It's uh, it's it's perfect third doctor. Just how uh, frustrated and indi indignant he is about it. I love it. And then there's also a scene toward the end when a guy is basically about to jump over a balcony and the, then the third doctor goes out to kind of get him. I love... The way John Pertwee's delivering the line, because he's basically not only, he's talking loudly, he's like yelling at the man, stay there, calm down, hold on, I'll come to get you, take my hand. The way he's saying his lines, he, even at John Pertwee's age when he recorded this, I believe this was recorded in like 94, the power behind his voice when he's saying those lines and the authority and command behind them. This is very much a man that, despite his age, he still has a strong voice. And when he tells you something like that, the 
command behind it. This is a man who's used to being in charge and the authority behind it really carry through. And as I was listening to that dialogue, I was so impressed by it, so impressed. I'm like, yep, the third doctor all day long with that authority and that John Pertwee he still had it. I was so impressed by that. And again, I like that Elizabeth is very much doing her journalism journalism thing, trying to get stories. She goes along with the Brigadier to try to get a story. It's kind of odd that the Brigadier would let a journalist go along with them. Because you figured being unit and all that, you're supposed to keep all this stuff secret and not let it get out. So you're letting a journalist and, and a photographer go with you. I will admit that's a bit of a plot hole for me, but we're going to go willing suspension of disbelief and roll with that. But I like the fact she's phoning in for a photographer. <clears throat> Being frustrated, they don't really send her a photographer. They just send her someone with a camera. Her trying to get pictures of stuff. Uh, obviously alluding to the, these people being from outer space and being able to receive and transmit brain waves. That's fascinating. Kind of makes me think of Batman Forever a little, which is an underappreciated movie, in my opinion. Um, and then it has a good cliffhanger at the end with, uh, the doctor and the guy that was on the cliff both tumbling over. He, he kind of gets he goes over and the doctor kind of got hold of him and goes over with him. That's a nice little cliffhanger. So I've enjoyed the first part so far. I'm finding it a lot of fun. It's just great hearing them back together again. It's great having all three of our main actors back again, John and Elizabeth and Nicholas. And then having Peter Miles is just the cherry on the top for me, having another Doctor Who adventure with him. And then the story I'm enjoying well enough so far. I'm liking it. I'm curious to see how it's going to unfold. Aside from that little bit at the end when I was a bit disoriented trying to figure out what was going on, other than that, I found it very enjoyable. So I'm going to go ahead and listen to part two, and I'll get back to you on it. And we're back to talk about part two of The Paradise of Death. And I enjoyed it. There was a little bit in there where I found myself drifting a little bit, kind of getting distracted, drifting. But it got me back. It did It did snap me back. I will say that. Uh, I like how the episode starts basically with the Doctor appearing to be dead. Sarah and the Brigadier think he died. The antagonist of the story thinks he died. But then when he's taken to the morgue, the brigadier, of course, being familiar with the doctor and the doctor's abilities, is not quite sure. So when the guy's getting there to examine him, first off, I think the brigadier is kind of hesitant. He's like, well, you have to understand he's not quite human, so the eternal organs might not be. But then he's also kind of like trying to explain to him, well, he might not be dead. You see, there's this thing that happened at least once before. And of course, that's right when the doctor wakes up from being dead, startles the uh, the scientist that was about to examine him, who's a scientist and a coroner. So it's, it's, well, I think he's a scientist. He's examining the bodies because of the weird circumstances going on. And the guy's like, but you were dead. The doctor's like, would you kindly get that scalpel away from my act? <laughs> I like that. The mortician's like, but, but you were dead. And he's like, yes, was I? Well, I'm not now, so... <laughs> Just the way he says that, it kind of reminds me of the five doctors when he's like, teeth and curls. Yeah, well, I haven't yet. It, it reminded me a lot of that. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not now. Again, I continue to be impressed with the performances from the main cast. Uh, John, Nicholas, and uh, Liz are putting in a good job. The guy voicing Sarah's kind of assistant photographer, is, it's fine. Not blowing me away, but he's fine. Peter Miles, I am loving there is one scene later on when he has Sarah Jane captured and tied up. And it's just so deliciously evil and almost sadistic, honestly, the way he's talking to her. And you, you strike me, he is a slimy, slimy, evil person who takes a lot of pleasure out of other people's pain and breaking other people. You can tell from the dialogue, and Peter Miles just delivers that dialogue in this slick, oily, dirty way. It just makes you want to wash your hands. And it, it even mentions that he doesn't even look human, that he's barely humanoid, that he's basically wearing a disguise. Whereas the other two antagonists are actually human looking, that he's actually wearing a disguise. He goes, do you want to see what I really look like under this? And he starts to pull it off. Even has a little sound effect, like he starts to put it off before he's interrupted by the phone and has not to. 
And Elizabeth's doing a really good job there playing Sarah, being frightened, but putting on a brave face and not not letting her fear consume her. But you can still tell she's scared and not quite sure what's going on. Again, this is early in her run, so she's still new to kind of all the stuff the Doctor has to deal with. And Elizabeth's pulling that off really well. I do love the scene when Sarah <clears throat> and the photographer stumble on to the creatures they were looking for because the murders at the beginning of the story were done by creatures that didn't seem to be human, which is what brought the brigadier and the doctor in in the first place, but didn't appear to be human was not the right word done by anything on earth, I should say. And it's neat to have them brought in, uh, of course, to analyze it. Sorry. My mind was wandering. Um, and of course, Elizabeth tells the photographer, he's like, okay, here's the brigadier's number. Call him, let him know what's going on, that we found the animals that did the murder. Let him know where we are. I'm going to go in there and investigate. And as soon as she said that, I'm like, oh, this is going to go bad. <laughs> as soon as she's like, I'm going to go in there and check things out. I'm like, this isn't going to end well. And sure enough, when she goes in there, the, the freaking building takes off. It turns out it's the spaceship. It takes off into space, heading back for like their home planet. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I'm just like, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> uh, so that was actually pretty neat. We had an interesting cliffhanger where the doctor, of course, gets the TARDIS working. And uh, he tries to follow her to that home planet. But they end up on the wrong planet because it's the TARDIS. <laughs> or it's the doctor piloting the TARDIS. And so they end up completely on the wrong planet, right in the middle of what sounds like a battle, a frantic battle. And that was the cliffhanger, which <coughs> I enjoyed. Like I said, I lulled a little bit in it. And I kind of got distracted surfing the web. And then it snapped me back, probably right around when Sarah was getting kidnapped. It really got my attention back. I lulled kind of between the doctor waking up and her getting on the what turned out to be a spaceship. But then it snapped me back and had me back. Peter Miles' performance was so deliciously evil. Good, but evil. <laughs> it's a great performance. And then um, I like the cast that all, I like the, the fact that the cast is written well. The third Doctor is acting like the third Doctor. Uh, Sarah Jane is acting like Sarah Jane, especially when Sarah Jane's written well. She's written very well here. She feels like one of her, definitely her better written stories. And the Brigadier is acting like the Brigadier also when he's written well, because occasionally he's not written well, but usually he's written well, and he's written well here. So I'm enjoying that very much as well and enjoying the story as it's progressing. We'll be back to talk about part three. So part three, uh, I actually lulled a little bit in part three. I kept getting distracted uh, a little. Uh, I don't know if that was me or the episode. I was a bit tired uh, last night when I was listening to it. Um, I really like Peter Miles, especially the scene when the one guard comes to pick up Sarah Jane and Peter Miles is acting all indignant and upset. And he's like, you wouldn't do that. And the guard just like pops him in the face. And Peter Miles' character's just yelling, you'll see, you'll pay for this. You'll pay for what you're doing. You know, he's just, he just goes off. And you should have seen the look on my face as that was happening. I was loving every second of it. The look on my face was probably gold. I absolutely loved that scene. Because Peter Miles, I just, I love having Peter Miles in this. I love when he shows up in Doctor Who. And he's just so good at playing a character that's just not a good character. His voice just goes so well with that. So his voice work he's doing there, especially when he's getting loud and mad and yelling, I love it. Uh, and for John, uh, Liz, and Nicholas, it's just impressive to me how easily they slip back into their characters. Like, John slips back into the third Doctor. Like, he filmed this right after Planet of the Spiders. I mean, of course, his voice sounds older, but, I mean, he just nails the role. And I like that the Brigadier is written more trusting of the Doctor, more like he is with the second Doctor a lot of times, how he's rolling with what the Doctor's saying and not being argumentative with him like he is with three sometimes. I like that. And, of course, Liz is very much being season 11. Liz, journalist, journalist, journalist. And I love how well the writing is on that and how well the actors are playing that. So it's interesting that the cliffhanger for episode for part two is resolved pretty quick. They leave the planet uh, and then they get 
to the planet they meant to go to ahead of Sarah and Peter Miles. And so the doctor just introduces himself to the president. So by the time Peter Miles and Sarah arrive, the guard's there just to escort Sarah to him, which Peter Miles hates. And the president's a pretty interesting character. The voice work for him's done pretty well. It's a bit, it's a bit of a fake voice, but with all the little nuances in it, I like it. And the president very much is in the dark about what's going on. Uh, he thinks everything is all great and above board, and he's happy to have ambassadors from Earth. Tells them about this new mineral that basically replaces everything, kind of like, um, it kind of reminds me of Axonite, actually. Like from the Claws of Axos, they just, you can use it for whatever. Um, when obviously there's a lot of, you know, the third Doctor's like, there's a lot of stuff going on here that he's not seeing. Like, he makes this bit about, you know, they keep taking ground, you know, they keep taking resources from the soil without putting anything back that, that shouldn't balance. That's just, you know, that, that doesn't work like that. Um, so I enjoy that. Of course, the doctor realizes that Peter Miles's character and the president's son, he finds out that the other character, the one that has the showman voice is the president's son. The doctor doesn't quite know how to deal with that information. And so they try to leave before getting ambushed, of course, by Peter Miles and them as they head back to the TARDIS. And that's the cliffhanger, and it's fine. Also, the guard, I'm not sure if the guard gets captured or killed, but the guard that assaulted Peter Miles, they pretty much set him up because he doesn't agree with everything that's going on there, so they try to frame him for treason. And I'm not sure if they killed him or if they captured him. I think they just captured him. There is a bit there when they're going to this little party area where it's hard for me to keep up with what's going on. Like, seriously, there's this bit, the bit right around where he's getting captured or whatever is a little confusing with the audio. I will admit my mind was kind of, doo -doo -doo, let's go check over here. Dee -dee 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 -dee. I couldn't quite focus there. So part three was probably the weakest part so far, but once I kind of snapped back to it, um, I enjoyed it well enough. So we'll be back to talk about part four. So I watched parts four and five. Um... And enjoyed them well enough. I did think it was funny when the photographer thought he was in this deathly peril just for the third doctor to go and check and find out he got his ankle stuck between two t tree trunks. That's hilarious. You can tell the photographer character, James or Jefferson or whatever his name is, is a bit of a scaredy cat, which I mean, being thrust into this situation, you know, not everyone's made to really be a doctor companion. And there's even a part in, in uh, episode five when the brigadier's in a firefight and at the end he's like you can get up now or you can come out now it's pretty funny uh <coughs> i didn't realize this was written by barry letts it mentioned that at the uh the end that barry letts wrote this that's interesting barry letts of course knows a thing or two about the third doctor era and i'm glad to know that he was involved in this production and it makes sense that he would be considering when it came out in the 90s um the actual story to me is it's okay. I mean, it's not, like, great, and it's not really bad. It's kind of, you know, right up there with the Claws of Axos and Planet of the Daleks for me, kind of the lowest part of the Pertwee era, but all the Pertwee stories tend to be good. It's fine. I think the main joy of this, of the Paradise of Death, is hearing these actors reprising these roles is having them come back to give us basically a new Third Doctor era story. And the joy of experiencing a Third Doctor story for the first time, especially with the original actors. That's one of the reasons this is so key for me over, say, Third Doctor Big Finish stuff, which I don't really have an interest in, is it is John Pertwee voicing the character. It is Liz Sladen. It is Nicholas Courtney. And I have Peter Miles back, as I've mentioned. That's a big deal to me. Having all four of them playing in this, again, with the first three reprising their main roles, and they feel like they've never been away from them. They, they feel like they slip right back into them, which I really appreciate. It's lovely hearing John. He still has, even at his age, that authority in his voice that carries command when he speaks and when he tells someone to listen. You can always tell he's the person in the room you need to be paying attention to, attention to and listening to. And I like that. And I love that this very much leans into Sarah when she's really well written. Her, the journalistic side of her, her curiosity, her, her 
curious nature. It really leans into that. And the Brigadier is also, this is also one of the one times where he's written really well because he's kind of hit or miss. He's usually good, but every now and then, like the three doctors, they don't do him justice and they do in this, which I like. <clears throat> I find parts four and five, uh, they just kind of roll along. By the time I got to part four, I was kind of just ready to finish the story, I will admit. It was interesting to find out that most of the story does take place on this other planet. I mean, the first two episodes really took place on Earth, with the other three episodes really taking place on this other planet. And um, the resolution of the story comes across pretty fast with everybody getting saved, really within the last four or five minutes, with basically... There's this other girl that comes in. I get a bit confused. I, I kept getting distracted while trying to listen to this, especially from, like, the third episode on. I, it was really hard for me to focus and pay attention. Um, there's this other girl who came in who's pretending to be another. It's really confusing, actually, to me. Uh, but she knows the king, and so she goes and explains to the king what is actually happening and that his son is in on it, and the king puts a stop to it. The doctor gets to have another one of his one-on-one -on -one arena battles, kind of like he does in Curse of Peladon. It does kind of borrow from other stories. Also in the Curse of Peladon, uh, Peladon when the doctor kind of hypnotizes uh, Agenor with the little lullaby he does that with another creature that's kind of like a t-rex here this giant creature he tries to do it doesn't quite work the brigadier ends up shooting it but it's a nice callback to agador and it also kind of calls back to curse of peladon with this little fight he gets to have where of course he wins but he spares the other person and the other person ends up saving his life because the president's son tries to get a gun and kill him and the guy the doctor was fighting the other gladiator grabs him and throws it into this giant pit where there's a killer toad at the bottom <laughs> you just have to listen to it i kind of figured somebody was going to end up in the pit the way it described it it took a minute to describe it i said one of the bad guys are going to end up down there and then peter miles character basically got arrested it, it did get resolved like really quick right there at the end i was looking at the time it had left going there's only like five minutes left this must get resolved really fast and it did so it's just kind of that quick um I enjoyed it well enough. It just kind of rushed through. Again, there was a few things I kind of got confused on. The security guard they were trying to save ended up dying. That was kind of sad. But like I said, it doesn't feel as refined as a lot of the stuff Big Finish does because Big Finish has been doing this a long time. Um, and just they seem to have it more audio in mind. Uh, whereas this feels like it doesn't quite have those refinements to it. The joy to listening to this is more hearing the actors reprising their characters, uh, be it the main three or other characters who played other, uh, who have been in Doctor Who for like Peter Miles. And I believe um, oh, the guy who plays the other Time Lord in uh, Twin Dilemma is in this as well. I'm not sure who he's playing, but I believe when I was looking up online that he's in this as well. Uh, so it's it's nice to see that. Uh, so I I enjoyed it more for that. I love when Peter Miles shows up in Doctor Who, and I love having another third Doctor story that I can say, "Hey, I got to hear this for the first time." Will I go back and listen to it again? Probably not for a long while. I didn't really think it was great. I don't really think it's bad. It certainly has moments, but it also has, I didn't think it was great. I didn't necessarily think it was bad. It just kind of falls somewhere in the middle. Like I said, I found after part two, I kept really drifting off. It was It's more just hearing these actors playing these roles again and the joy you get from that. And having, you know, being able to experience a piece of Doctor Who from the Wilderness Years era. Because <clears throat> that era, of course, we didn't really have much on TV. It was really just a TV movie and, you know, The Curse of Fatal Death. Little, little stuff. Uh, to get... <coughs> another piece of that era and be able to hear it. I'm sure it was a big treat to uh, fans in the mid-90s who were able to listen to it, and especially fans of the Pertwee era. Uh, it's just nice to have the main three actors back in their roles, to have Peter Miles back, to I believe the guy who, uh, one of the actors from Twin Dilemma is in it as well, I believe. The guy who plays the Time Lord in that story, I think, is also in this. So I did enjoy that. So because of that, I find it enjoyable.
even if the story is a little lacking to me. So I want to know what you think of the Paradise of Death. Comment down below and let's talk about it. Don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button and the bell for notifications so you never miss out on another video. All the other fun stuff down in the description, links to the Patreon, links to the Amazon wish list, links to the Amazon UK wish list, the PO box, all that fun stuff's down there. I want to give a shout out to Colin Coney, one of my top tier patrons. I appreciate his support as I do the support of all of my patrons and YouTube members. Most importantly, thank you for watching. So, part three, not really a lot to say about part three. Um, I kept losing my, uh, I kept losing my, uh, train of thought. Mmm. Mmm. I'm still losing my train of thought. <laughs>